Welcome to the Mio on MMA podcast. Once again, breaking down PFL playoff action and UFC 305. Actually, not breaking down. We're unpacking the fights. Breaking down is when I tell you who's going to win. We're talking about who did win and how they won. So let's talk about PFL first. Let's real quickly get that out of the way. I know people are here more for the UFC. Impa Kasangani, Josh Silvara was the main event. Impa Kasangani winning that fight by unanimous decision. No real doubt about it. He had the more impactful strikes. Was largely able to stifle Silvara's grappling game. And really, I mean, I will give Silvara credit. He kept trying. He would he would walk through fire at an impressive rate in this fight. But he just at no point really had an answer for Kasangani, which makes sense. Because they fought each other before. I think like something like nine months ago. Kasangani won then. And Silvara has been preparing for different opponents all that time. Like, it's the problem of any rematch in the PFL is that at the end of the day, you're not really focusing on the guy that you're fighting. Like these are all short camps. And if you lost the first time, there's a good chance that you're going to lose the second time. And then in the other co in the other uh, semifinal, do let Yag uh was victorious by unanimous decision against Rob Wilkinson. Wilkinson's problem essentially is that the best part of his game lately anyways, has been like, dirty clinch boxing and at no point did he feel comfortable confident about closing the get distance and actually making that part of his game against Yagshmurdov so he tried to do kind of this distance outside boxing game which makes sense he's like four inches taller and has a, a sizable reach advantage but it's just not his game it's 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 fighting against type and I kind of wish he would have just been Rob Wilkinson and gone in there and tried to you know, do his thing. But hey, Yakshmirdov is in the final. Kasangani is in the final. A pair of dudes in the 205 finals for a million dollars that are under six feet tall? That's weird. The lightweight fights went more or less how I expected them to, although Gadzi Ra- uh, Rabadanov actually finished my Cal do four by ground and pound and a uh, left, ho- left hook on the feet to get the knockout win. So... The first round, largely like I thought it would be, Rabadonov, you know, being the oppressive, pressuring, wrestling, boxing force, and then killing him in the second round. So, you know, good work there. Brett Primus basically grapple after Clay Collard. He'll go to the final as well. I pretty much have to pick Rabadonov in that one, even though he's quite, he's, he's, despite the knockout, he's kind of a dull fighter, but like, he is quite good. Biagio Ali Walsh, Defeated Brian Stapleton. Here's the thing. I'm not going to be interested in Biagio Ali Walsh until he gets to the point where he's fighting people that I'm actually interested in. Because, like, this fight, Stapleton missed weight and whatever, but, like, Stapleton is in his late 20s, 500 amateur fighter making his pro debut. It's a can crush. And to be clear, Biagio Ali Walsh is, like, 2-0 as a pro, so he should be crushing cans right now it's just it shouldn't be on the main card of america's second biggest mma promotion you know what i'm saying like that's not what it should be but whatever he's he's got flavor he's related to muhammad ali obviously he is the grandson of muhammad ali and also you know has the godfather being flavor Flav. so we're going to, you know, use that connection to try and make a big deal. And if it works, it works. I I just, I can't say that I am interested is the problem. Danny Savatello versus Lazaro uh, Dayron ended in a draw when Dayron got a point deducted for grabbing the cage. You know what? This was a pretty fun fight. I mean, Lin Savatello can't just out grapple you and can't just like pin you to the mat. It gets kind of scrambly and kind of fun. So, you know, it was a reasonably fun fight it was about as fun as you can get with a Savatella fight where he didn't lose. And uh, that's all there's to it. <laughs> Mads Brunel pretty much dissected Elvin Espinoza, who I think made several mistakes about like, well, I shouldn't say mistakes because the thing is, is I think Burnell would have won anyways. I picked him to win. And I thought that there just really wasn't a game plan for Espinoza outside of the big shot that was going to lead to a victory for him. So I guess, I don't know, I can't, can't. He, he clinched with Burnell quite willingly. And I th- th- thought that was on paper a very dumb move. We'll put it that way. 
Thaz Zhang, Chris Brown had a surprisingly good fight. Jordan Oliver showed off his stand-up game against Braden Akio. That was good to see. Like, it was his second ever win, and he went out there, and until the third round, really didn't put any of his NCAA Division I wrestling uh, on display. So, that's good. You're up there against a guy who you can probably just kind of bully. Get some sparring time in. Get, you know, work the work the hands, work the feet, work the legs. It wasn't bad. For a guy in his second straight fight, with or a second career fight, out of a wrestling background, his stand-up is not bad. Now... To be clear, if he gets stuck standing with somebody who's actually good, he will get walloped. But, baby steps. It was his second fight. For for a second fight, it was quite good. Michelle Montague steamrolled uh, Marilla Marais. And that's the card. So let's move on to the UFC card. We had, of course, DDP versus Israel Adesanya. Main event. uh, Middleweight title. Of the world, at least the UFC, but like, you know, UFC title, world title. Yeah, generally speaking, there you go. Let's start with the positives for Adesanya. There were moments where Adesanya's footwork looked sharp, particularly in the third round, which I had him winning. I had him up two rounds to one when he uh, got subbed in the fourth round. First round is a toss up. Very, very close. I just thought he had the slightly cleaner shots, basically. That's all there is to it. But... There were moments where DDP was able to catch him moving backwards. And obviously it was Izzy trying to fight a little bit out of character, a little against type. And I wonder if that maybe drained him, but he was landing an uppercut basically for free for most of the fight. He was working the body quite well. He had DDP quite tired. Although that doesn't matter with DDP, it seems like DDP is this bizarre creature from the Black Lagoon, where it's basically, he is bad, but somehow incredibly effective. And I don't know how to explain it beyond that. It is so weird to have the best middleweight in the world right now be a guy that I don't actually trust to beat anyone. (laughs) Like, like, He can fight anyone who's ranked in the UFC and lose, and I'm not going to be surprised. Like, this is a guy who cleanly lost around to, like, Darren Till. Like, I I don't know what to say about it. Anyways, it was good to see Israel Adesanya put up a pretty decent display, although the fourth round comes around. DDP is losing the round, I thought, pretty cleanly. And, you know, nice combo. The uppercut is there. The body work is there. The Izzy is, you know, evading DDP's rushes and doing a good job. And then DDP catches him with left hook. Izzy is wobbled. And then he wobbles him again. Swarms into a takedown, takes the back. RNC gets the job done. He almost had the RNC in the second round as well, which was the round he got to ground Izzy for the most part for about like three minutes of the round. But... Gets the job done in the fourth. He is the champion. I will say, John Anik, he is not... John Anik was like going, he's a really, really classy guy before he actually got classy, which was a bit weird. Because let's be honest here, the whole first African, real African, blah, blah, blah stuff between these two was not classy. And to be clear, not classy on either end. But not classy. <laughs> not classy. I mean, I, let's be clear. Izzy Adesanya was a guy out there circling uh, dick bulges. So I'm not going to call him classy on the matter. But you know what? At, at, at the end, DDP was pretty gracious in victory. Set the stage for Izzy to retire. He did not. And uh, he'll continue on. So next fight, Sean Strickland in South Africa is the promised fight for DDP. And for Izzy Adesanya, this is not going to happen. But I actually really like the idea of Mich- the winner of Michelle Pejea versus Anthony Fluffy Hernandez. That that would personally be my pick. Kai Car France versus Steve Ursag was pretty, pretty simmerish for a flyweight matchup. There wasn't much happening for 90 seconds. Then, you know, KK marginally ahead. I thought he had the slightly cleaner shots. Three minutes in, we're still kind of simmering. Ursaig starting to find some counters on the dashing uh, Kaikar France. 
But then, boom, overhead le left drops Ursag, staggers backs up, gets dropped again, gets finished. Kai Car France has his first win, again, over a UFC flyweight. He actually had none coming into this, of course. I, men I mentioned that. And uh, he calls for a title shot. I think that was, uh, I think that's out of the question. I, I, it's a weird one. Like, I, I wouldn't begrudge Kai Car France a title shot. But it does feel very odd that a guy with a one win in the UFC over an active flyweight, which is this one here, would get a title shot. Particularly against a guy that, keep in mind, it was a it was a tough fight, Ultimate Fighter, but he did lose to Pantoja. So I can't say that I would be thrilled by the idea. Anyways, I would give him. Kai Asakura. You sign Kai Asakura, and I think that would be a dope fight. For Ursag, I don't have a good option. I was looking through the rankings trying to find a guy who fit and was like, Mano Cop makes the most sporting sense. But am I the only one that thinks that would just be a really dull fight? Anyways, I don't know. I, I guess Ursag Cop is the answer, but you know, is what it is. We had a judging uh, controversy in the Hooker versus Gamrot fight with a lot of people calling for Hooker to have lost this fight. And I want to I want to have a look at the stats here real quick. So round one, I scored for Gamrot. They both hurt each other. And Gamrot also had two takedowns for a minute and a half of top control. Outlanded Hooker by, per UFC stats, seven strikes, six of which were significant. And... I stand by that. I do think that was his round. I understand who people who gave it to Hooker. It's a close round. It really is who got the better strikes. But I think it is in the end, that one. Then in the second round, Gamrot's getting takedowns again. Two for four. Two minutes and 37 seconds of control time. But he is getting pounded in that control time. He is eating elbows to the body and elbows to the temple Getting caught in a guillotine choke, I think, like, twice in the round. Like, he he diffused them really well. But Hooker was still, like, attacking the neck when he would go in for takedowns. Getting the headlock, elbowing into the body pretty repetitively. I had to give him the round. And then the third round, kind of the same thing, basically. Gamrod going one for five on takedowns. Slightly outstruck, and I think the quality of strikes were way better for Hooker. He, over the course of the second and the third round, Gamrot's one eye got like basically swollen shut. And that's visible damage for the damage criteria. I would not have hated a Gamrot card, but the people sc screaming robbery are just wrong. I guess in a nutshell, they're, they're just... They're just wrong. Now, I will say, I do have a bit of a problem with the judging here because, and it's 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 basically every card except for McMeany, the card that actually went to Gamrod, ironically. And that is that Ben Cartlidge and Mark Christie, who scored the fight 29-28 for Hooker, gave Hooker the first round and not the third round, or not the second round, which to me is a bit weird and awkward because Gamrod's offense was at its best in the first round. He hurt Hooker in the first round. He had some takedowns. Things were at their best for Gamrot in the first round. It's the only round that he landed more strikes than Hooker. So I think if if you have a 29-28 card for Hooker, it's the first round that goes to Gamrot. You could give the second round too. That's why I actually don't really have a problem with the card that went to Gamrot. But it does seem really bizarre that Gamrot was able to get round number two and not round number one, despite the fact that it was objectively a better round. Like he had more top control in the second round, don't get me wrong, but he got hit more and he got hurt more. <laughs> so I, I don't get that. I, I, again, top control is not supposed to win rounds. It's not supposed to win fights. Again, I have no problem with him winning the second round. It's like a one-strike difference. I'm not going to get angry at it. But like I said, the damage he did was the first round. He had Hooker bleeding. He had a little swelling of Hooker's face. He had Hooker hurt. Those were That was the most effective offense Gamrod had. The second and the third round were worse rounds for him. My opinion. Anyways, 
Next opponents, Hooker versus Fazeev would be the fight I would do, but I have no idea what Fazeev's status is because, of course, he blew out of his leg against Gamrot. So you could do Duke Bronx, I guess. There's not really anything else at the top at the top of the pile that actually makes any sense. He called for Conor McGregor. You could do that. He called for a title eliminator. You could do that. That would be the Du Bronx fight. As for the Con, like the Connor one has a lot of appeal, to be honest, but like Connor's gonna do what Connor wants to do. And I don't think that's fighting Dan Hooker. Gamrod have against Chandler, which is weird because it's Chandler who's waiting for Connor, but I don't think you're getting that fight, man. So you might as well just take Gamrot. I don't know. Tai Tu Vasa for Jar- Jarzinho Rosenstruck. Not a lot to say about this fight. Uh, it should have been a clear cut 30 27 for Rosenstruck. One judge got that right, which was David Letheby. He scored all three rounds for Rosenstruck. Charlie Leach, or Charlie Keach, pardon me, had a bad scorecard that went for Rosenstruck 29 28, giving the first round to Tui Vasa. And I. I don't know why. Here are the numbers from round one. 19 to 6, six strikes and total strikes in favor of Rosenstruck. So two to one, basically volume. I don't know why you would give that to, to Ivasa. I don't get it. And then the second and third rounds were even worse, 37-13 and 36 to 15. So yeah. And uh we actually had a judge, Howie Booth, who scored this. 30-27 to Ivasa somehow. To Ivasa landed 37 strikes the entire fight. For comparison purposes, Rosenstruck landed 37 strikes in the second round. And there was no like there was no grappling to consider. This was a pure kickboxing fight. Rosenstruck landed the harder strikes. He landed more of them. There is no way, in my opinion, to score any of these rounds for Tuivasa. So, like I said, Charlie Keach. Boo, but like Howie Booth, really boo. I don't, mm, nope, mm, mm, nope, nope, nope. All the media scores were 30 27 Rosenstruck. So that's uh, Sure Dog, Sure Dog, Sure Dog, all three of their scorecards. Kate Side Press, Severe MMA, MMA Draw, Wrestling Observer, MMA Junkie, The Score, Combat Press, MMA Uno, Sure Dog again. Sure Dog has four on here. Jesus. MMA Fighting, D, uh, DDR, DDR Reporter, I don't know that one, <laughs> and Sports Illustrated, all 30-27 for Rosenstruck. So yeah, Keach and Booth both, I think, failed. Booth got removed from the remainder of the card, was supposed to judge the, uh, or I think it was the Ursaig Kaikara France fight he was supposed to judge, which he would not have been needed, but like it was good to see him get removed. Rosenstruck versus Sergei Pavlich is about the only thing that really makes any sense. And Tui Voss I've got against the winner of Waldo Cortez Acosta and Chris Barnett. Or honestly, even the loser of that one, if it's Barnett, I would be acceptable <laughs> to Leach. Uh, Jean, Ling, Lee, uh, Jean Lee versus Carlos Pratis. This was a fight that I was very, very wrong on. It was kind of my like one really bad pick for the card. Obviously, I had other losses here. Uh, I picked Gamrot to win. He did not. I picked uh, Junior Taffa to win. He did not. We'll talk about that in a bit. I picked Josh Kuhl about a win. I think he did, to be honest, but like he should have been better. So whatever. And I picked uh, Luana Santos, who did lose. But like, well, I guess Santos and O'Neill was really a lot wronger. But like Taffa Walker went about what I thought it would. And, and Ramos versus uh, versus Kulbao went very, very similar to what I thought it would. And same with Hooker and Gamrot. But Practice just absolutely styled on the leech. Like every time he decided, I'm going to throw a big committed left hand to your head, it hurt the leech and had him staggering backwards and had him questioning life's choices, I imagine, on an astrological plane. (laughs) That's how hard he was hitting this man and nearly sending him to the shadow zone. This was very impressive. Now, I will say the leech showed bad. Fight IQ. It was brought up on uh, one of the podcasts I listened to. They're like, well, we're a little bit worried that the leech doesn't really handle range strikers very well. And I knew that. But his response tends to be to crash the clinch and try to make it into a, a grapple fest. And it didn't work against, like, for example, Neil Magny. But, like, I thought it would work against Pratis. And he never, never really tried that. Just kind of kept getting lit up. So... 
that's disappointing to be honest. Not 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 that he lost, but that I don't think he had what you would call a good game plan. Now, like the strikes landed were very very similar. He actually actually landed more in the first round, but like the quality was so in Protus's favor, it even knocked him down twice in the second round per UFC stats. So there you go. Protus had a call out, but I honestly. I've watched it like three times and I still don't know who he was calling out. It apparently was his birthday. There you go. Awesome. I have him against Randy Brown. I have the leech against Gabriel Bonfim. But if he wants to walk away, because let's be honest, this just did this did not look like the proper leech. This is him coming off of a neck injury and a spine injury, if I'm not mistaken. Well, both of them are spine injuries, but I mean like two separate areas of the spine. Yeah, I... I I, I, I could see this being the end. But if he is going to be around, Gabriel Bumpy. Then we had Junior Taffa versus Walter Walker. Uh, Walker getting the win here. He was losing early on. He was getting powered. He was looking very uncomfortable with Taffa coming forward and throwing big old power shots at him. Walker shoots it for the takedown. Gets him down. Can't flatten him out. Taffa actually like crawls to the cage to wall walk his way up. Also gets away with, like, I think two th- two cage grabs during this time period. Walker gets another takedown, though. This time he falls off the top position, but, like, grabs a leg, goes for a heel hook, gets a tap out. By tap out, I mean scream of pain, which caused a lot of controversy because people were not happy with this. Because there are people who seem to not want that to be a thing. They don't want fights to end if there's a submission hold applied and someone screams in pain. And I don't understand that because that's it's a win for everyone. The guy in the submission hold gets injured less. The promotion has him not on the shelf for months after months with a ripped up ACL. The guy on the bottom ends up with a win. Or, well, the guy applying the submission, I should say, ends up with a win. The yeah, I, I, I don't get the appeal. There were people who were like, really, really demanding a rule change there. And of course, Dominic Cruz was one of them because he was like blaming the referee for taking an opportunity away. It's in the rules, Dom. You comment on this sport as for a living. Please read the rule book. Someone in my Discord server pointed out that like once upon a time, Dominic Cruz was considered to be like the smartest man in the sport. And we really need to rethink that (laughs) because his commentary career has made it very clear that he is a dumbass. Anyways, he was DC's best friend on this one because DC got to look great in comparison. Walker, after the fight, gets slapped by Taffa. Don't know why. You yelled for you yelled in pain. It's a verbal submission. I don't know what you're angry about, Mr. Junior Taffa. Walker called out Justin Taffa to purge the bloodline from the octagon. Not helping the whole clean monster like uh, nickname and 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 uh, and very very Germanic for a Brazilian uh, name, suggesting that your family may have arrived in the country around the 1930s to 1940s. Anyways, uh, I don't see why not to give Walker Justin Taffa. <laughs> it makes as much sense as any other fight. And I've got Junior Taffa against Lucas Bresky, Josh Kulabal versus Ricardo Hamos. Now I think this was a bit of a robbery. And I want to bring up the stats because they're probably going to back me up on this one. But Hamos ended up getting a split decision here. I want to break this down. So Judge Ben Cartlidge gave Kulabau second and third round. So he had my card. Mark Christie and Mick Meany gave the first and the third to Hamos. UFC stats is loading up very slowly. My apologies. So we'll go through my notes and then we'll get into the in the numbers. So round one, I have no problem with Hamos winning. He pressured Kulabau. He was landing the better shots. Hurt his shin on a low kick. Kulabau fl- flurries at him and it's like, all right, he's going to take advantage of this. He slips and then ends up with Hamos on his back for like, you know, <clears throat> the last 70 seconds of the round with Kulabau fighting off a rear naked choke that looked pretty tight a couple of times. So. No problem there. Hamos got the better of the grappling. Got the better of the striking outside of hurting his own leg. And that's, you know, that's kind of it. But then round two comes around. 
And Kulabau knocks him down, goes to town on the leg on the ground instead of, you know, getting him to come up, tries to, you know, dodge around the uh, the guard, hit him with hammer fists in the ground and permed. I had to let him get up. I don't understand it. I think it allowed Hamos's leg to recover slightly. Even Dom Cruz, with one of his few insightful moments of the night, you know, the leg does come back to life unless it is like structurally damaged. Like unless we're talking like a broken leg, broken, uh, you know, torn up ligaments or whatever, which I don't think Hamos had. I think this was probably a nerve moment where like, you know, you kick something on the wrong port, you hit your nerve, boom, boom, you know, things, things go downhill. And I think that's what had happened. So anyways, he managed to get up with about 80 seconds to go. Hamos got away with an eye poke. We go to round three. Round three is Kulabau. I really want you to kick the kick the calf. Why are you not kicking the calf? And this is re- this is repetitive through my notes. Repetitively. Also, there was a point where Kulabau even like crashes into the clinch and Hamos sneaks onto his back, takes him down, has back control. Kulabau gets back to his guard, but it's like Ugh, you're making this fight way closer than it has to be. Now, again, I still think he won. So here are the numbers. Kulabau outlanded him apparently actually twenty to three in the first round, which is weird. Cause I thought that I thought that Hamos landed a couple of good shots. I guess not, but second round 36 to 12 and the third round 36 to 24 with just a minute and 28 of top control. That's not a round for Hamos. So I don't feel bad for Kulabau because it's his bad fight IQ that led to this even going to the judges scorecards. Cause he should have finished this in the second round. But at the same time, I don't want to re- reward Hamosh for not having a winning plan. <laughs> like, it's just, he just didn't win. That's all there is to it. it he should not have won this fight. Kulabau should have. So I'm angry Hamosh won. I'm not angry Kulabau lost because I like Josh Kulabau. And a big part of why I picked him here was I thought he had good fight IQ. Apparently I was wrong. Apparently I was wrong. Hamos versus Damon Jackson, Kulabau versus Muhammad Naimov. Casey O'Neill versus Luana Santos. Now, to be clear, I didn't see most of the second round here. The uh, ESPN stream effed up for me. And where's the 10-8 round? That was the one thing I was wondering about. Okay, so O'Neill got a 10-8 third round from Evan Field. Clean sweep, otherwise. She did win the second in the th- or the first in the third. I, I Again, I can't talk about the second. But yeah, essentially... This was the ideal fight for Casey O'Neill. She was able to obviously outpace Santos pretty easily. 29-20, 28-13, 56-13 to in strikes across all the rounds. Uh, in terms of significant strikes, it was 24-16, 25-12, and 34-13. to By the way, 56 strikes landed. I don't know. 34 of them being, I, I don't know. I don't think there was a 10-8 in that third round, but okay, whatever. And what takedowns there were, were largely from, oh, well, actually O'Neal is not credited with a takedown, which is weird because she did end up on top. <laughs> but anyways, Santos was only able to get one out of five takedowns of her own. Got one in the second round, wasn't able to do much with it. Anyways, O'Neal looked good. But I do have to say, I do have to caution that Santos is a very raw striker. So being able to outstrike Luna Santos does not mean that much. It's as good as it was going to be because I didn't think she would be able to finish Santos or anything. I'm just saying that like, well, I liked some of the things that O'Neill is working on. I don't think that there was a fundamental shift here. And also hearing her talk about in the fighter meeting about like, Believing that she didn't, that there wasn't anything she didn't prepare for against Ariadne De Silva slash Lipsky uh, does leave me a little bit concerned. But uh, she got the win here. I've got her against Veronica Hardy next. I've got Santos against Teresa Bleda. Jack Jenkins beat the crap out of Herbert Burns and stopped him in the third round when Burns wouldn't get up from guard. There were a couple of moments of this fight where Burns is real slow getting up from guard position. He was getting worked on the feet and really couldn't get anything going on the ground. Like he was, he he was, you know, safe on the ground, I guess. But like, let's see here. Striking numbers, please. UFC stats. Why are you being so bad right now? I don't understand why. Performance of the Knights went to Kai Carr, Franz, and Carlos Pratis. Fire the Knight to Dan Hooker, Matush Gamrot. 
Yeah, I'd probably agree with all those. Anyways, he was outlanded uh, 73-24, dropped twice, and Burns had two takedowns of his own. <sighs> the problem here is, is the classic Burns problem. He just does not have it in him to go on when the going gets tough. And Jack Jenkins was able to brutalize his body, brutalize his legs, and hurt him to the head as well. So there's not much else to say. Jenkins called out uh, Gavin Tucker for the Edmonton show. Could do that. I also have Melsic Bagasarian is not a bad idea. And for Burns, I, I don't care. He's a good BJJ fighter, and he actually has a fairly dynamic striking game. I really wish he could be something. But we're at the point where, like, I just have to say, he's not. He's 36 years old and just getting broken in these fights. Like, it's not it's not entertaining to watch, and it's not good for his long-term health, and it's not good for his mental health, I don't think. So just, just, just you know, do BJJ coaching, my man. Tom Nolan versus Alex Reyes was basically what I expected it to be, minus there was no knockdown, or pardon me, no knockout. It was basically Nolan beating the crap out of Reyes. Apparently, the strikes landed was like actually pretty close, eighty-four to twenty to sixty-nine. Reyes got two takedowns, but like there was there was nothing here. Nolan was able no no Nolan if he actually had like decent like uh, resetting footwork would have absolutely torn him apart without any return fire. It's just that Nolan is not actually Nolan is not particularly good at anything. He he has all the physical gifts like he's. Decently powerful, decently coordinated, and very flexible for a guy who is six foot three. He's not like clunky in the way that some tall fighters are, but he fights tall. Like his defense is not good. His ability to keep things on the outside is not good. And it's just that Reyes is bad. Like, I don't know. There's not much else I have to say about the fight. It's just Reyes, Reyes giving his neck, given his neck history, just should not be fighting. And I've got Nolan against Mauricio Rufi next. Has a certain appeal. I, again, there is a... I said this uh, on Twitter. There is a good fighter in the marble block that is Tom Nolan. There is. Like, there is there's no limiting factor for him. He has all the physical check marks you want. He's huge for the weight class. He's powerful. He's dexterous he's fast for a guy that big and he doesn't seem to have like any kind of like mental hang-ups about like you know getting into a firefight it's just he doesn't have a great chin and his defense is terrible and his offense is only really good because of the physicality to it and not really because of any technique so beating victor martinez and now alex reyes just doesn't matter Rufi, if he can do something with mauricio Rufi. That would be different. Kanon Song versus Ricky Glenn. This was some early success for Glenn and like pretty consistent success for Glenn and being able to like crash, crash into the clinch and so on. But like it was very clear that like at welterweight, he can't really impose his wrestling on anybody. And Song is way more powerful than him and a better, you know, um, striker. The problem for Song really is that he's not very good at denying clinches. He's not very good at breaking clinches, and he's 34 years old, so I don't think that's ever going to change. Still, he did beat up Glenn pretty badly here. I scored the first round for Glenn, but uh, I don't even think that that's necessarily a a requirement. Let's see here. Uh, Howie Booth did score it for Glenn. That doesn't make me feel better. (laughs) That That is, in fact, the judge who got removed later in the night, so... I don't feel great about that. Media scores? Media scores were all 30-27. Uh, let's see here. Do I have UFC stats to kind of bail me out, maybe? Strikes were 37 to 30. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I probably I pro- I pro- I probably need to reverse that that depend. <laughs> I want to give all three rounds to Song. But anyways. For Ken and Song, I've got Phil Rowe. For Glenn, I don't know. He's at welterweight, which makes no sense. He needs to sort himself out, figure out, figure out how to get back down to 155, I guess. He's 35 years old. It wouldn't be a bad idea to retire. He's just going to eat a lot of damage going forward. But anyways, 
Stuart Nichol versus Jesus Aguilar. Aguilar missed weight for this one, so it is a 127 catch weight fight. Aguilar bum rushes Nickel early. Ends up chain wrestling with him, though, which is Nickel doing his thing. Aguilar ba baiting him with a Darce choke, which leads to a kind of almost like cartwheel escape, which was pretty, pretty damn cool. Pretty damn cool. And uh, ends up scrambling up. Nickel shoots in on him. He jumps the guillotine. By he jumps, I mean Aguilar jumps because that's what he does. Ends up on bottom, but he chokes uh, Nickel out despite Dom Cruz protesting that he was totally fine, even though he was lying on the, on the ground, face up at the ceiling. Um, DC was very correct. Tom Cruise was very, very wrong. Aguilar got, got against Jimmy Flick. It tickles me, but I think Flick is gone. If not, you could go with Ray Saruya, who we know is on contract. And then Nickel gets a Dana White Contender Series grad. By the way, what is the deal with signing Stuart Nickel? You just got rid of Muhammad Mokayev, at least partially because you didn't like how he fought. And you go out and you get an Australian version of him who's just going to be worse. Uh, and is older. So there you go. Let's have a quick look at the upcoming cards for the PFL and the UFC for next week, which I'll break down in full. PFL, Brandon Logan, Kai Kamaka the third, Umalatov, Gracie, Musafaya versus Ramazana. By the way, I'm uh, you know, I'd be I'd be really actually fairly happy with Ramazana versus Musayev if it wasn't literally the last fight that these two guys had and Musafayev knocked out Ramazanov. Spoiler, picking Musafayev. Uh, Gabriel Braga versus Timur Kizriev. Those are the playoff fights. And then otherwise, we got Ray Cooper versus Mukhamad Berkhamov. Who is this guy? I recognize the name. Oh, this is the dude who lost to Lorenz Larkin. Okay. 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 And then Tyler Diamond versus Enrique Barzola. Jesse Stern versus Je Jose Perez. Eric Alquin versus Luca Pocklet. Mark Greeley Alves? It's a weird name. Versus Brian Zercher, who I've been pretty impressed with during his like brief PFL run. Looked really good against Jordan Ruiz. And then for the UFC fight night, we've got Jared Cannonier versus Kyle Bahio. Angela Hill versus Tabitha Ricci, the co-main event. Edmund Chabazian versus GM3. Michael Morales versus Neil Magny. Ryan Loader versus Robert Valentine on the main card. Why? Not that there's anything on the undercard that screams that it needs to be there, but Dennis Bajushka, Danny Silva would be better. They have UFC wins. Jose Medina versus Zach Reese. Vyacheslav Borchev versus James Lontop. Josiane Nunez versus Jacqueline Calvacanti. That's probably the most impactful fight. That should actually be on the main card. I know it's not necessarily a good one. And then Kong Wang. Great name. Victoria Leonardo. Man, Vinari Leonardo is going to get her arm broke again. <laughs> like, her arm is begging her to retire. Roman Coppola versus Bruno Fajaya would have made that card a lot better. But hey, it's not on anymore. Check down below for my social medias, my video gaming stuff, and the link to the Discord server where you too can produce, can pick fights in the Mio Fight Master series, as well as make a fighter in the MMA simulator. Which... Shout out to Javier for picking up a win with one good arm in the sim. Very impressive. Actually tore his uh, labrum in the sim uh, in the first round of his fight and still managed to win a decision unanimously. So there you go. I will see you guys. Well, you will hear me uh, on Thursday.